I mentioned that there was, some, there was another interesting um, trend playing out here that I wanted to hit on. So we're going to narrow our focus here a little bit to just one bedroom units, you know, which, which tend to be smaller. Uh, the type of stuff that may be going out of favor with, if you're stuck at home uh, permanently, you need the home office here. Uh, this is an index chart. So we're, we're calling where rent levels uh, at the start of this year, January 1st, that's going to be 100 on our chart here. And we're looking at nationally and in Los Angeles, how overall rent levels have, have moved in this one bedroom space. Um, so you can see nationally uh, at the start of the year during the busy summer or spring leasing season, uh, as we'd expect, we see rents in one bedroom start to grow. Then the pandemic hits, um, they start to fall, uh, a little bit of stabilization during the summer leasing season. Uh, and now as, as winter is approaching again, um, we see rents in one bedrooms trending pretty steadily downward again, although at a, at a, at a very mild pace, um, only about you know 1% lower than where they were at the outbreak of the pandemic. Um, in Los Angeles, not only have the losses been more pronounced, but we really haven't seen much of this, this bumper stabilization that we saw um, in, in the United, you know, in the wider U.S. Uh, even though we're not quite as, as seasonal and depending on uh, dependent on that spring and summer leasing season as you know a, a northern or a, a, a east coast metro might be, um, but you can see one bedroom uh, rents trending downward steadily pretty much since the outbreak here. And that makes sense, right? For the same type of renter we were talking about. If you're now home working remotely 24 seven uh, and you've been working from your kitchen table or from the couch for the past nine months, a second bedroom is probably sounding pretty attractive right now, right? Even for more space, you could turn that into your home office. Uh, when you're just home all the time, a one bedroom starts, starts to feel pretty cramped. Um, excuse me here, my... And then when you look at um, the other unit types, uh, that, that, that trend uh, really just starts to become more and more evident, right? So uh, our one bedrooms, that's our green line here. That's what we just saw trending downward, right? Studio bedrooms, even smaller floor plans, less square footage. Um, usually the studios are built in, in a downtown or a walkable neighborhood where uh, the attention is most of your activities are gonna be taking place outside of your apartment and um, you're just coming to the studio to, to sleep and, 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 and shower and stuff. Well, that's not gonna work now that everything's closed and all the restaurants are closed, you need, you need a kitchen and a place to do your work and things like that. So studios, one bedrooms, really tanking. Uh, two bedrooms, uh, while overall we're seeing some losses in that space, um, not as pronounced uh, as in your smaller units. And then three bedrooms, we, you know, um, which are going to be more prevalent in, in areas like the San Gabriel Valley where uh, the inventory is older because we just don't build a lot of new three bedrooms these days. These are holding up real well. Um, rents are pretty stable and, and more or less where they were before the pandemic. So um, I think that really speaks to the, the overall um, renter trends that we're talking about, right? We're looking for affordability uh, and we're looking for more space uh, because we're just more of our lives are, are, are operating at home now. And it's funny how a change in the market can choose new winners and losers be, because before, let's say we were selling a building that was heavy in three bedroom units uh, for a client. Mm -hmm. uh, buyers had a negative connotation of that because they're like, well, who's going to rent those? It, it's probably going to be two families doubling up. Now you have more wear and tear on the unit. And now here we're saying, hey, three bedrooms is, is, is the new one bedroom. I mean, essentially. Yeah. So it's yeah. just interesting how things change. Yeah, that extra bedroom is, is very likely a home office now, right? For, yeah. at least for, for people, Many people to keep yeah. the jobs and, and are still working remotely. So I, I did want to break this down, you know, not to belabor the point too much, but just look at it one other way that I, I think also probably will, will speak to your audience here. Um, looking at urban and suburban communities. So urban obviously are more densely populated, uh, more likely to be your, your central and west side sub markets. Uh, and then suburban communities, um, you know, your outlying areas, San Fernando Valley, San Gabriel Valley, uh, uh, and, and, and places like that. So here's our overall one bedroom trends, right? But very different performance depending on what part of Los Angeles you're in. Uh, if you are in a dense urban area, um, it's been pretty much a story of, of rent losses, uh, pronounced rent losses since the onset of the pandemic with no real end in sight, very little stabilization, just a, an ongoing trend. But in your outlying areas, uh, your valley areas, your suburban communities where, uh, again, as we've mentioned, units tend to be cheaper, units tend to be larger, 
And you kind of, for many people, you have the perception of safety because you're just not as, as crunched in and it's easier to social distance. Um, so really bucking the overall LA trend, our suburban communities are, are doing well, or, you know, relatively, and overall rents in, in these areas are higher than they were before the pandemic. So it's, it, it's one of the reasons I started off talking about how large LA is, is because these countywide trends really hide some, some very interesting um, divergence in the market here. So I, I think what we're seeing is, is larger, more affordable units in, in less dense areas of the type that are in the San Gabriel Valley, Southeast LA, Pasadena to a lesser extent. That is very demonstrably where rental preferences are shifting right now, away from the smaller uh, studio and one bedroom apartments that have been so favored by developers over the past 10 years or so, and toward these larger, uh, older, less expensive units here. And uh, I think that's, uh, so, so that's kind of where we are with you know, the overall vacancy supply and demand picture. Um, and, and, and that's really what influences rents. Um, so just to kind of to give an idea of where costs are when we're, we're talking about this move toward affordability, this is overall rent levels per, uh, on average monthly rent per unit um, in, in our target submarkets. So here's Los Angeles, uh, the LA County as a whole. Uh, prior to the outbreak, uh, we were approaching the, the prior to 2020, we we're approaching that $2,000 a month sort of benchmark on, on average in LA, uh, but have trended downward obviously since the outbreak. Um, in Pasadena, which on, on average is more expensive than uh, LA as a whole, uh, rents on average, you know, $100 to $200 more a month, uh, pretty similar trend lines here. Uh, but then as we move down into the San Gabriel Valley and Southeast LA, where um, renters can save $100, hundreds of dollars a month, uh, really some of the most affordable areas in the entire uh, metro, um, really not much evidence of a slowdown so far, right? Um, still a little dip in San Gabriel Valley, uh, but overall rents have continued to trend upward here. Um, I've included our rent forecast and you can, you can see that, that pretty much across the board, it anticipates a, a, a bit of a dip in, in rents at the start of next year. Uh, that's driven by uh, forecasts for job losses. Um, we use Oxford Economics as our, as our job provider. Uh, and they are um, expecting sort of a, a, a employment shock as the year turns over and, and some of these uh, protections that have been in place expire. But you know, if you take a little bit longer view, um, looking at two, three years, uh, generally the expectation is, is that once the economy and the public health situ situation uh, recovers, it's more or less back to business as usual in Los Angeles here, really regardless of whether you're looking at the, the market as a whole, uh, the, the pricier areas, the less expensive areas, um, the, the underlying dynamics that we talked about early on that made this such a hot market for so much of the last decade aren't probably are not going to be fundamentally shifted by the pandemic, right? This is still going to be an area that a lot of people want to live. It's still going to be very difficult to build enough new housing to keep up with all that demand. And as a result, landlords and property managers are probably still going to uh, have the playing field tilted toward them and have most of the leverage. And I'm curious, is any of this data influenced by who may or may not be president, uh, whether the vaccine is going to stick or not, or maybe, maybe said better, is the vaccine going to work for, you know, uh, the population at large? Uh, are these forecasts dependent upon that as well? Yes. So th there's two main drivers that go into, the f into these forecasts. First is the historical commercial real estate data that CoStar collects. Historical performance, we know you know, how the market has moved during previous periods of instability, uh, we can refer to that. Uh, the, other, uh, the other input here is Oxford Economics job growth forecast, uh, because we have found that that's the job growth is the best correlation to the performance of multifamily properties, right? Multifamily demand. Um, so Oxford in their job growth forecast is accounting for uh, the implementation of the vaccine, is accounting for potential changes in um, regular, the regulatory environment and the political environment in their job growth forecasts. And through that forecast, that is making their way into the commercial forecast. So we don't have, you know, a, a Joe Biden wins and a Donald Trump wins buttons that you can, that you can push to see how, um, but we do, and this isn't going to be relevant to, to your entire audience, but for anyone who is a CoStar subscriber has access to the data, we offer a variety of different scenarios. So if job growth outperforms, you can, you can see that more optimistic scenario and you can see how that impacts the projections for rent growth. You know, so if we add more jobs, 
this, the, this dip will not be as pronounced and the overall trend lines will be more optimistic. If we lose more jobs than, project, than projected, um, you know, the overall dip will, will be sharper than what we see here. So, um, you know, your results may vary. Obviously, predicting job growth in this atmosphere is, uh, is, a, is a pretty fraught task because there's so many unknowns out there. But um, this is kind of modeled around a, a general view that there is still going to be some short-term pain uh, especially around the turn of the year, that that there might be some, you know, pronounced job losses at that time, but that um, at, around mid-year, as the vaccine becomes wide, more widely available, that the economy will start to accelerate, and and, and 2022 will be, um, hopefully, all systems go. So that's kind of um, where we are, um, you know, for for overall rent levels, and I, I thought we'd just take a look at at growth. Um, you know, this is annual growth, so from the start of the year to the end of the year, um, how much growth have we seen? Um, and overall, you can see for, for most of the last decade, um, LA really outperformed the United States as a whole. Uh, you know, at times uh, we were growing by a, a percentage point or two percentage points more uh, than the United States as a whole for most of the last decade. That's that outsized growth that I've referred to a couple of times. Uh, but as we said in 2019, uh, we were already seeing some evidence of slowing. That was the first time that that uh, annually LA rate, uh, rents did not grow as, as at the same pace that the national rates did. Uh, and now while nationally um, rents are essentially stagnant on the year, um, that's why you don't really see anything here because uh, after everything, they're, they're largely in the same place they were at the, the beginning of the year. Um, in 2020, rents down by about one and a half percent in LA as a whole. Uh, but again, that, that county level view does, does hide some, some interesting trends uh, that kind of reinforce uh, a lot of what we've already talked about here. Uh, when you look at overall rent losses and gains by, by quality segment or by, by different slices of the market, again, that class A space, the top of the market where the supply risk is, where retro preferences are shifting away from, pronounced losses here of around 5%. Um, your mid-tier sort of uh, Class B three-star space holding up better with losses of about 2%. And then your, your Class C, again, your one and two-star properties, as we saw, the areas that, that renter demand really seems to be flowing towards um, posting, posting growth this year, despite everything that's happened. So, um, and when you break down, you know, who sort of the winners and losers on a sub-market basis are, uh, this just reemphasizes everything that we talk about today. So uh, looking at year-over-year -year growth, uh, number one with a bullet, the Antelope Valley. Um, and that is, you know, obviously not because everyone decided that they wanted to go live in the Mojave Desert. It's because Antelope Valley's average rents are about $1,000 less than the rest of LA County. So affordability, um, renter demand flowing to where the affordability is really gives landlords in those areas a lot of pricing power and a lot of leverage. Uh, similar thing playing out. And, and, you know, some of our subject properties are here, St. Gabriel Valley, Southeast Los Angeles, obviously Pasadena, a little bit pricier, um, it, it is not going to be on this list. Uh, but this is, you know, kind of a who's who of the least expensive submarkets in Los Angeles. It's it's pretty clear um, where the demand is right now, and, and where renters and, and where landlords and property managers um, still still have some leverage. Of course, the flip side of that: areas that are heavily built, areas that are pricey, are the ones where rents are um, coming down the quickest. Uh, and Pasadena does creep onto this list. Um, you know, Pasadena outside of Central and, and West LA is pretty much the most expensive sort of suburban or valley community um, in Los Angeles. And so that trend that we're seeing that flight to affordability um, is impacting in, in Pasadena as well. Though. But even in Pasadena, again, that's you can really break down the top of the market, you know, the new stuff that's been built in, in downtown in the Playhouse District uh, and separate out that performance from your older product, which is still holding up pretty well. Same trends that we're seeing playing out in LA. You know, this is not an LA specific phenomenon. We're seeing it um, in, in individual cities and counties and states and across the country. Um, it's a pretty clear shift in retro preferences. We'll wrap up today with just a quick look at the, the capital markets, the investment scene. Um, so this looks at overall uh, sales volume, how much money is being spent and invested in, in each of the main property types that CoStar tracks uh, in a given year. Uh, so first off, obviously, the evidence of, of the pandemic, the impact of the pandemic is clear, right? right? We're, we're close to the end of the year here, just a few more weeks in 2020. And overall, in the commercial and multifamily markets, uh, total investment is about half of what it was in the past few years here. Uh, but that you can see in Los Angeles that, um, you know, while 
earlier in the last decade that, that the office space and office assets were kind of the preferred investment vehicle, um, that began to shift uh, later in the decade. Um, you remember, we saw three, four, five years of, of rent growth in, in 4%, 5%. That's going to grab a lot of investors' attention. And, and yet a lot of money, a lot of capital flowing into LA, chasing these assets, trying to get a piece of that growth. So while things have cooled off uh, noticeably in 2020, uh, we still see investors looking to prefer um, uh, in, uh, multifamily assets or really any other type of class. It's kind of interesting to see, uh, just as a quick aside, to see industrial leading uh, office investment here sort of speaks to what's gone on this year and the shift in consumer buying and, and how, how we get our goods and, and where we're doing our working this year. The industrial properties and logistics properties um, are a lot more important these days. Um, this is a breakdown of sales volume again by quarter. So just a, you know, a way to get a, a feel for, for how the, the market tends to move, how investment tends to move. Um, in, in a lot of years, although it's not a hard and fast rule, um, you tend to see investment accelerate, you know, slowest at the start of the year. And a lot of times these big deals getting done in the fourth quarter. Um, doesn't look like it's going to be the case this year. Obviously, you know, we still got a few weeks to go to, to record some sales and things like that. Uh, but overall sales levels after a, a quick start to the year, you know, that, that, that outperformed where we were in, in many of the previous years. Obviously, the impact of the pandemic is, is clear here. Um, most investors content to sit on the sidelines here, kind of let the water settle, uh, let things work out, maybe let some of these eviction moratoriums and other um, regulatory environment, let all that get settled out. Um, but it is worth noting that deal volume has not entirely evaporated. There are, there are still multifamily trades getting done. Um, the, the things that made LA so compelling in all these years, right, that, that, that drove nearly $11 billion in multifamily trades each of the last two years. As we said, once, once the economic and public health situation improves, those factors are still going to be in place here. LA is still going to be an attractive place to, to own and invest in real estate. Uh, so you see, even you know, with the, the worst global health and economic crisis of our lifetimes, uh, there's still some deals getting done from LA multifamily properties. Um, just a quick look at county level pricing. Um, you can see that uh, <clears throat> pricing peaked in 2019 uh, at around uh, $350,000 a unit. Again, this is at the county level. Uh, so you'll find wide disparity depending on what part of town you're in. Uh, we have seen pricing decline in the limited trading that we saw in 2020. Um, if rents uh, do at the market level do continue to, to kind of um, decline or, or stagnate for the rest of the year, uh, we do expect to see maybe pricing drop a bit more. Uh, but again, you know, that, that bump in the road characterization I made, when you look at the forecast, um, expectations now are that when the external conditions improve, that we will largely get back to, to business as usual in LA uh, and that run up in pricing that we saw for most of the last decade um, will, will really sort of resume. Uh, and, and on the flip side of that cap rates, which I, I would imagine most of your audience is familiar with, uh, kind of just a, a, a way to measure the overall return and, and, and perhaps risk of investment, um, you know, cap rates uh, declined uh, for most of the last decade. That's an indication that you're paying top dollar, right, for, for LA apartment assets. Pricing had run up so long uh, and so fast that the overall returns were, were diminishing. Um, just a little bump in the road here again as, as pricing declines and, and you know, risk increases a bit. But overall, we expect to see cap rates remaining at that, that very low, uh, between 4 and 5%. And our last slide today, I, I appreciate everyone sticking with me. I, I know when I have to look at more than 15 or 20 slides in a row, I go kind of cross-eyed. So I, I promise if you've made it this far, you, you're, you're at the finish line. Uh, but this is just a breakdown of, of pricing um, in, in our target submarkets. And really no surprises here, kind of mirrors what we saw in um, the, the, the breakdown of quality and, and rental rates here. Pasadena pricing um, climbing and, and had neared $400,000 a unit on average um, prior to the outbreak. Uh, and, and really, you know, we're not seeing much evidence of uh, price declines here. It, it's more just stagnation um, that the, you know, the long years of growth that we saw earlier um, during the last cycle uh, have, have kind of um, given way to a period of, of pretty stable prices here. So just a couple uh, questions as we wrap up here, Steve. You know, the old adage that the real estate moves in about 10 or 12 year cycles. Um, looking at your charts, it looks like uh, if we're going to go forward starting in 2023 in terms of a, a positive direction, then this, this is the market correction that we're in. 
And it's surprising that the market correction wouldn't be more steep. And of course, you know, we discussed, you know, playing if the, you know, if this, then what, uh, you know, what's the scenario, possible scenarios, but it, it's not much of a correction and, and landlords should be, uh, you know, very content. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's, it's hard to know how much this is going to follow sort of historical paths because this is such an external sort of artificial catalyst to this downturn. It really had very little to do with the underlying real estate conditions, whereas the last downturn was, you know, all about lending and then things like that. Not the case here. Um, so, you know, as we said a couple of times, there are already some indications that the cycle was cooling prior to the outbreak and, and, and the rent growth was slowing. So, yeah, I think there's a very good argument that um, the pandemic likely just accelerated some trends that were already kind of manifesting and that, I guess the big question now um, and what our forecasts when we look at the numbers that seem to indicate is, is that going to be it? And when the external conditions improve, are we going to get back to this period of growth? And, and our data says, yes. That's good. That, that, that's good news for the industry. That's, that's good news for landlords. Um, and then just, just finally here. So in summation, essentially uh, we are in a low of the market. We've in general seen vacancies creep up because vacancies have crept up. Asking rents have declined depending on, on where you are. Winners and losers, uh, sounds like in, in C areas or C product types, uh, you're doing fairly well right now. And if you're at the upper end of the food chain, um, the A quality assets or A type areas, uh, you know, you're filling uh, this adjustment more than everyone else. Um, and so, but again, not much of an adjustment. Looks like it's only going to last, you know, here if, if all the trends hold and there's not a new surprise, you know, imagine if 2021 was worse than 2020. I mean, who, <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to imagine that. Right? <laughs> so, uh, you know, again, if the trends hold, then, you know, it'll be back to business as usual. And uh, so, again, I mean, it, it, if you at, at Coast, not you, but Coast are in general, feels optimistic going forward. Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. And, you know, particularly in Los Angeles, that in general, the LA housing market is defined by this disconnect between supply and demand, right? By the inability to build enough new housing to keep up with all the demand. On the supply side of things, it's not going to be any easier to build in LA um, once things return to normal, right? The regulatory environment, the, the land costs, the community opposition, those are all still going to be there. Uh, I think the only question is the, the demand side of things. You know, um, once we're all, once we, you know, does some of that demand that's maybe flowed to the Inland Empire to a place like Phoenix or Las Vegas, some of these cost burden houses, um, are they going to come back when the economy improves or are there going to be new renters, new, new arrivals to, to fill that space? Um, historically, the answer is yes. LA is a, a strong draw, the, the, the name and the cachet of the area. Um, both, you know, nationally in the country and internationally, it's a very popular destination and arrival point um, for for people moving to the United States. And with the new administration cut, coming in, uh, that will likely accelerate as well. So um, while, you know, obviously we need to stress that there's still a lot of unknowns out there and that trying to forecast the market today is even more uncertain than trying to forecast typically is that based on the information that we have, based on the trends that we have, and based on kind of the long-term structural advantages that owners have in Los Angeles, that um, yes, there is reason for optimism that uh, when the, the external conditions improve, that the market is, is positioned for a good recovery. Well, Steve, I want to thank you for your time. Thank you uh, for being so gracious with, uh, you know, CoStar's data. I, I know this is a little outside of the norm in terms of, you know, publicizing all that uh, CoStar tracks. So thank you for that. And as we head into the holidays, no surprise for any of us, uh, holidays are going to be a little bit different this year, but I wish you and your family uh, the best of the holidays and looking forward to a new year. Same to you and, and all your audience. Thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, hopefully next year will be a lot better than this one. <laughs> all right, sir. Thank you. All right. Have a good one. Well, I hope you found today's episode insightful. I hope this was the information you needed. I hope that it's timely and I hope that it helps you as you begin to consider and ponder what changes, if any, that you're going to make to your portfolio come the new year, you're able to 
go forward on solid ground. You have sound footing now with the factual data, not what the media is purporting to be truth about the market, or maybe even sometimes what our gut can tell us because our emotions sometimes can be our enemies, but the facts, that's how investors make decisions based on math, statistics, analytics. Be sure to like this video, be sure to subscribe to our channel. Continuously, we're sharing education, educational content like this with investors like you to lock arms with you as you walk through the day-to-day -day management of your multifamily properties in doing what, as we say, building your financial legacy in multifamily investments. Be sure to share the video as well. What investor do you know, or maybe even uh, those in your professional network, could this information help them in their day-to-day -day rentals? We hope, however this information can help, we hope that we can assist you in that way. Chris German from The Apartment Dealer wishing you positive cash flow, tenants who behave, and much protection from Uncle Sam. Till next time.